Welcome to House Masters, presented by Home Projects. I'm Steve, and as always, I'm joined by my colleague, John. Before we get into this, uh, this, this podcast and this YouTube video, we want to ask you to subscribe to our channel, both in YouTube and whatever software you're watching a podcast on. Hit like, hit the little heart symbol, whatever it takes to let people know that you're appreciating what, what you're watching here. Um, if you're also interested, let YouTube and your software know that you'll be interested in getting notifications when we push new content. Um, this is intended to be an organic discussion between you and me and John. Obviously, you're not here in our studio with us, so you can't talk to us in real time. So we encourage you to comment on this video in YouTube or leave us a, a, a rating in, our, the YouTube, in the, your um, podcast software. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about what we're about ready to say or have said or suggestions for future um, videos, um, also visit our website, homeprojects.com, and you can send us an e email from there which John and I will personally respond to. We encourage you to do that. Look forward to hearing from you. And last but not least, we also ask that you make a donation to this cause. Of course, this cause with Home Projects and, ho and House Masters is to get information out to the public um, about, the, uh, about the construction industry from both the homeowner side as well as the construction side, the industry pro side. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that here as we get into our next episode. But you can make that donation at our website uh, via um, GoFundMe or PayPal donations. And there's also a donate button on our YouTube channel um, right to the lower left-hand corner of this video. So we encourage you to do that. So uh, with no further ado, John, we are here um, to explain to people why their second floor is hot, the mystery of the knee wall. Um, of course, a knee wall being uh, a, a particular structure in your house, usually on a second floor, that causes a lot of angst with heating and cooling. So I'll turn it over to you and uh, walk our, our viewers through the mystery of the knee wall. Okay. Well, um, this is a perfect time to be doing this particular video because hot. we're right in the <laughs> hottest week of the month or hottest week of the year thus far here in the North Carolina uh, market where it's mid nineties. And, um, I'm sure right now there's a number of uh, people with the architecture in their home that where they walk upstairs and it's 10 to 12 degrees hotter than anywhere else downstairs. Yeah. Uh, judging from my vast experience with this, this, uh, back when I was a performance contractor, this was the most common by leaps and bounds most common call that we got during the summertime and anywhere from June through the end of September, we used to get these calls. We've got them probably five to one to anything else. And the first question that we would always ask a homeowner when they called about this problem was whether they had short knee walls in any of the particular rooms that were particularly hot. And more than nine times out of 10, that was the issue. The other thing that was very prevalent with these particular calls was the fact that they had already had an HVAC contractor out or three of them <laughs> to come out to do repairs to the HVAC system. Because automatically when you have a temperature differential in your home, conventional wisdom would tell you that you're going to have something wrong with your HVAC heat ducts or air your, your air conditioning or you know whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case in this particular uh, situation. So um, nine times out of 10, it's directly uh, caused by a lack of or a or not enough insulation in the particular wall. And we're gonna go into some physics here in a second. Um, we have seen through my experience, drastic cases where, I mean, it could be a, it could be a, a bonus room or what we call a frog family room over the garage. <laughs> Those are extremely prevalent with this problem, or it could be, you know, you could have a, uh, second story or what they call a story and a half yeah. where you have dormers coming off the house and then the back wall, uh, across the entire back of the house is knee wall. 
uh, along the roof line. And your entire in that situation, your entire upstairs would be affected. So it could be either the entire upstairs or it could be the bonus room. Another situation is if you have a completely cut up architecture to your house where you have this room jutting off to this one and it's an L shape to this room, a number of different configurations can create new wall space. And this is often associated with homes that have what we call a story and a half where there's major living spaces in the attic. So if you look at your house from the outside and you have a, a one story living space and then a big roof with dormers in it, that's what John's referring to as the knee, the knee wall space. John, do you mind before we go too much further to explain, kind of give a, a, a technical uh, definition of what a knee wall is from kind of two sources? Um, yeah, yeah. If you want to do that, go ahead. So real quick, so um, there's two there's two prevailing definitions of what a knee wall is, and the first one is my expertise, the building code, and it, that defines a wall. Um, and, and John will show some graphics here, but a wall that does, is not full height. Um, they call it a knee wall because it comes up to your knees. That's literally why what, what it, what's, why they call it a knee wall. Um, it's not a full height wall. Um, usually three or four feet tall um, uh, and, um, and, and very prevalent in like dormers and bonus rooms, frogs, as you put it, frog, frog. Uh, what, what was the acronym frog again? Well, it's family room over the garage. Family room over the garage. <clears throat> Then the other definition <coughs> is actually um, created by the real estate market for defining living space uh, in a uh, in a room, uh, and they define a knee wall as any wall shorter than seven feet tall, and um, and, th and technically it's a wall that is not does not contain living space. So if you have a, a room with a seven foot ceiling and it slopes down to a knee wall. It's only five feet tall. Everything between the seven foot ceiling and the top of your five foot knee wall is not considered living space because its ceiling is less than seven feet tall. Now that may differ from state to state, um, but in <clears throat> John in our industry and in, in, in our market, um, that's what that is. So I just want people to understand that um, a knee wall is nothing, any, anything more than just a wall that's not as tall as the other walls in your building. And it, yeah introduces okay, let me add interesting a, a framing technical techniques. definition on top of that okay. technically speaking a, a knee wall is a wall that separates living conditioned air yeah. from unconditioned air but not outside correct so in other words you will have your your living space which is conditioned space just like in this photo then you're going to see your vertical wall and then you're going to see your roof line coming diagonal diagonally off of that particular vertical wall so that the roof line actually is the the barrier from the inside to the outside but the true thermal barrier is the knee wall itself and the above it so let's stay on this photo for a while, Steve, okay. and go over some of the physics and how this works. The the disadvantage to a knee wall, and and this is actually, some people call it a flaw in the building code. Um, I don't necessarily classify it as a flaw, just by virtue of the way a wall is built. Okay, on an attic or an attic, you've got your floor joists, and you can heap as much insulation in between and over those floor joists as you want to, as long as it meets the geographical zones code, like in this particular area of North Carolina, where zone three, it requires R38. So you can go R38 or above in that ceiling area, above that room. The problem is, is with a knee wall, you've either got a two by four or a two by six, very, uncommon for a knee wall space to put that insulation in so with a two by four wall you're going to put an r15 vat which is less than half of the insulating value of the r38 above it or, or above the room so you got r38 in the ceiling steve's 
drawing his pretty pictures now. <laughs> and then you've got R15 in your two by four wall. The problem is, is if you look at the diagonal plane of that roof line, it's all contiguous airspace. So if that room or the, if the attic space above the room is 130 degrees on a July day, the space laterally to the roof line is also going to be 130 degrees. The problem is, is you have less than half of the insulating value to stop that transfer of heat from the unconditioned space to the living area. Yep. In a bonus room situation, you have the garage beneath you, which in most cases, obviously 90% of the time, it's going to be, again, unconditioned space. So what ends up happening is you have the garage beneath you, you have the attic above you, and then you have your knee walls on both sides laterally, which means that that bonus room or frog is literally surrounded by very hot air. And that space between the garage and the floor of that particular living area is also going to have bad insulation in there. Problem is, is you've also got airflow occurring. Okay. So if you see in this particular photo, you've got insulation coming from the far bottom roof line on the left over to the right up and then back over to the far right of the roof line on the other side. That insulation coming down off of the bottom of those knee walls is meant to block the airflow running up under that particular room. If those joists are running left to right. Now, in some cases, they could be running front to back. Right. Then you would have to find a way to be able to block that airflow on both sides. And most of the time, we would baffle that. But this is a common situation right here. This is a, I mean, this is what 90% of your bonus rooms look like. I have one. Yeah. I mean, I, I do too. Um, and then anytime that you have dormers coming off of the house, whether it be in the front or the back facade of the house, you're going to have some sort of knee wall because what it's doing, what that dormer is doing is it's creating an intersection at a 90 degree angle, which architecturally creates an airspace behind a wall. Yep. Okay. Just by virtue of the way it's built. So that's the soup to nuts right there of, of what a, bonus room looks like how it's uh insulated and we can now get into some of the ways of how to possibly fix this situation so the only the only thing um i, I know you're not going to focus on this but um if this was a garage down here um if this space is a garage uh, for some reason my my thing went away if this is a garage down here building code would require insulation in here. So that's, exactly. that's the only thing that's really wrong about this graphic, but um, that's just me being picky. The next slide shows you how an actual knee wall is actually constructed. Now that particular knee wall there is a four foot knee wall. As Steve said earlier, in a lot of cases, you'll see three feet or five foot knee walls. Right. Um, and then obviously with that, uh, living area, what I classify as living area, not what code is. Um, you'll see a, uh, uh, an access door usually cut into the knee wall so you can access behind it and use it as attic space. We, on the other hand, as contractors used it as access to get behind that wall and properly insulate. Okay. Now, before we go into the actual, um, solution to this problem steve why don't we go to that third photo as well okay this is a good photo to show here because this is a situation this isn't just a straight knee wall but this is coming off of a dormer you see the window to the top right hand corner that little jut out there is the dormer 
which is creating architecturally the small space uh, of knee wall space. Yeah. And then you can see the insulation on the floor beneath it there. But those vertical walls also have insulation in them at R15. Now, an older house is going to have R13, okay, because that's what the code was back in the older, uh, when the older homes were built. But so we've got both of those particular perpendicular walls there that are not insulated properly to stop that 130 degree heat that we're talking about in the summer. Okay. Now, what do we do to solve this issue? In another episode that we did, we talked about how uh, insulation works and what R value is. R value is, is resistance to heat flow. Okay. So in other words, if you have R15 in the wall, it's going to take much less time for heat to transfer through it than if you had R38 in the ceiling. In fact, it's going to take less than half the time through an R15 wall than it is through an R38 ceiling. So very briefly, a couple minutes ago, we talked about airflow. When you have airflow, that creates the transfer that we're talking about here. So what we want to do to solve this issue is block off the airflow at not only the top of the knee wall, but also the bottom of the knee wall on both sides of that particular room. And Steve, if you could use your- So you're uh, talking about here and here? Top of the knee wall, bottom of the knee wall. Oh, so that, you know, you're not, that's not what you're talking about. So you're talking about literally here and here. You got it. Okay. So when you say break off were, airflow, are you referring to the airflow that's coming in from the eave right here? Correct. Okay. All right. So we want to block that from getting into the particular living area. Okay. We also want to block the heat transfer that's occurring through that particular wall. And what we do is we, in that situation, is we apply a rigid foam board or a rigid insulation of some sort it could even be plywood plywood's difficult to seal off though um we used a product called armax armax was good because for one it was a half inch thick you know, i think one of, if my memory serves it was r3 per inch but your your benefit wasn't coming from the R value that it was adding to the wall. It was coming from the radiant barrier scrim that was on one side of that particular foam board. Okay. So what would happen is, as we talked in the previous episode about what radiant barriers do, radiant heat is a, a straight line going through a plane to get to the other side. Okay. So if you got 130 degree heat in the attic, and you've got a plane separating it from the living area, you want to stop that heat transfer from occurring. Again, the R R15 bat's not going to stop it. It's only going to resist it. We want to stop it. So we apply the rigid foam board on the back side of that, uh, both of those knee walls. We tape all the seams and we seal the top and the bottom with spray foam. And that blocks off all the airflow coming from those lateral attics. So, John, why couldn't you just simply put more insulation, bad insulation in the wall? Could you, if you've got R38 down here and uh, something equivalent up there, why couldn't you put that same bat insulation in here? Would that do the same thing as the extra board? Or does the board provide an additional value that the bat insulation normally wouldn't? Or is it because it may fall out because it's now vertical? Well, that, that's one reason why you wouldn't. For okay. one, you would have R38 bat, which is uh, 12 inches thick. Then you'd have two by four walls. So your effective R value has to be, you have to account for the two by four uh, studs Yeah. to come up with an effective R value. Two, R38 bats don't fit into a two by four wall. So you have to build at okay. least a six or an eight inch wall is what you're, what you're talking about. Exactly. Okay. So again... We're looking, and then the third reason is R38 is not going to stop the heat. It's going to resist it. Okay. Okay. Now, 
you could put R38, I mean, conventionally speaking, you could put R38 on both sides of the walls, and yeah, it's going to cool down the, the room. But it's not going to cool down the room to the level that you need to. Okay. Okay. Remember, you've got heat coming from four sides in this room. You got it coming from the attic, the two lateral attics, as well as the garage beneath it, if you're in a room over the garage. Yep. Okay. So the idea here is to stop the, the heat flow from occurring. And the only way to do that is to apply a rigid foam board or a rigid board of some sort that can be sealed uh, on the back side of that wall. Okay. And so when you started this conversation, you started out with the concept that this is cannot be solved by mechanical systems. So in this situation, there'd be a duct duct work up here that is kicking air into the room here, um, cold air or hot, depending on what season you're in. Um, and again, in another episode, we talked, especially with uh, Tim Destacio, this duct is now being susceptible to all the heat coming in as well. Um, yes. So the duct work is, has some insulation value around it, but it, again, is not anywhere near that or even this. And so you're cooking the air, and then the air is being you know, mechanically blown through a ductwork into the room. And so your air conditioning system um, cannot solve this problem. Um, you would have to send like 32 degree air through this ductwork from your main compressor outside, allow it to heat, probably, but in that transfer from one end of the house to the other, probably gain about 10 or 15 degrees in heat and temperature to dump, you know, 50 degree air into this room just to overcome the fact that you don't have the R value here and you're probably leaking from the corners. So that's just not feasible. You can't, you can't run a system. And most of us don't have systems that you can send that cold air just to one room. So that's why when you started this, this, this is not a mechanically, a mechanical solution. This is strictly a building science solution through insulation. Yeah. Let me add another problem in that ceiling that we, we see mostly in older homes. A lot of times that ductwork is laying up there in a small ceiling and there's no access to that attic. You can't get to it. So in an older home, a lot of times what we would do is we would cut a hole, a two by two hole access Call a into the ceiling so we could get access to that ductwork because we knew if it was an older home, it wasn't R8 insulation going around those ducts. And more than likely it was metal duct at the time. So if you had a house built in the sixties or seventies, chances are that very well could be metal duct up, duct up there. Yeah. And it's got R2 or R4 insulation. So the air that's being blown through that particular duct is even hotter than what you were actually describing at R8. So we would go up, we would insulate it properly to the R8 that met code. And, um, we would also make sure that the insulation wasn't compressed up in the attic. A lot of times, you know, if, if it's a 40, 50 year old house, that insulation settles after time. Absolutely. And you might have six or eight inches up there left over. So we would blow it up to the R38 uh, code. So um, everything that we're talking about, just like you just said, Steve, uh, is non non mechanical. Again, three quarters of the people that would call us with this issue had called an HVAC contractor out. And all they did and was the blow tech, colder air in there. <laughs> yeah. And it, well, that, that's what would happen is the tech didn't know the building science behind it. So he would say, well, we just need to add extra supply. So we, they'd run an extra supply line to it. That didn't fix the problem. So that pissed the homeowner off. So he calls another HVAC contractor out and he says, well, he doesn't know building science either. The tech doesn't. So he says, well, gosh, man, your system's out of balance. <laughs> you need to add another return. Yeah, because you're putting too and much air in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the object with the heating and cooling system is that your supply CFM equals your return CFM. Correct. So if you're out of balance, you're either, you know, if you've got an extra amount of supply, you're actually pressurizing that room. If you don't have enough supply, you're actually depressurizing it. So it's... in other words, you're sucking air out of the room. And for those who are listening, CFM means cubic feet per minute. So that's the measure of how much air your HVAC system's putting air into the room per minute. Um, just 
acronyms all over the place. Um, I also wanted to point another thing out with this picture here. Um, I mentioned before that um, knee walls have different heights based on different, uh, and they're d defined by different codes. When I was building, um, I always, pref the building code says that any, and, I, and this is a general, a general statement, any wall, let's say under four feet high, does not require an access door into the attic space beyond. Of course, this is what we're talking about. This is the access door. Um, and this door is not insulated. This is just a wood door. If you're lucky, yep. if you're lucky, it's a core, it's a, uh, uh, a hollow core door. So there's at least some air resistance there, but more than likely this is a solid wood door. And wood's, wood's a fairly decent um, uh, insulator, but not anywhere near the R18 or 15 that's in that wall that it's surrounded by. So this also, in, a, just in addition to all the leaks at the top and the bottom, like you're saying, is also a big heat suck. So we would actually build the retaining wall, or the retaining walls, the knee walls short enough so building code did not require these access doors so we could eliminate this, this um, transfer. Of course, that also prohibited um, the homeowners from storing stuff in the attic, but there's much better ways of storing things than putting it in, in that small of an attic. So I just, wanted to, I just wanted to show that. Well, the other thing that's glaring about that particular door and where the actual problem lies with this door, because it is more than more than likely a solid core wood door. Yeah. There's no what there's no weather stripping. Yeah, there's nothing around here. So what's happening is you're getting a ton of heat transfer from the perimeter of that particular door. So yep. what we would do is after we would apply all the rigid foam board and seal everything up on the walls, we would actually apply uh, weather stripping around that particular door and then we would actually glue uh, rigid foam board along the back, On the back side, side of, of that it. particular yeah. door slab. Yeah, you'd, you'd end up with a purple, a, a pink board right here. You got it. It probably has a picture of a panther on it. Well, we didn't use the pink panther. Oh, you didn't use but, the pink <laughs> um, we, we, we used Armax, but, Arm. um, yeah, that's right. which was a Dow product. But um, but but that's that's what we would do to stop that actual heat flow right yeah. at the door. And a lot of, you know, some, some uh, upstairs it might have five or six different uh, knee wall access. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, some rooms have two or three. Yep. Uh, so you, you really have to pay attention to those. But, you know, we've gotten into the weeds like we wanted to on this episode. Um, this isn't meant to be a long episode, but it is extremely prevalent in the uh, southeast area of the United States as well. I mean, the, pretty much the entire south. Um, and anywhere where you're getting above 90 degrees uh, during any day, uh, during, the, during the middle of the day. Um, something that you had said in a previous episode, Steve, um, that made me want to jump right back in the knee wall business uh, was uh, <laughs> during COVID, you know, people were home during the day. And a lot of people, a lot of homeowners didn't realize they had this problem because by the time they got home at 6, 6.30 at night, it cooled off. the sun was halfway down, the temperature was actually down a little bit, they weren't home at 2 o'clock in the afternoon Correct. where this problem actually starts. I've been in actual knee wall uh, or in um, bonus rooms before that were 12 degrees hotter than the hallway outside the room. Yep. And we, after applying the rigid foam board to the uh, knee walls, brought it down to a degree to degree and a half difference from the outside. That's how much of a drastic difference there is from the solution that we prescribed. Yeah. Well, I think we, I think we've probably brought this about as far as we need to. Uh, we could get, we could probably dive into this for a whole another hour just talking about science of it, but. We wanted to make sure that homeowners who have this problem understand what's happening um, so that if you call, um, so hopefully you won't call an HVAC contractor, or if you do, uh, call somebody who has the ability to insulate as well, uh, has the, the skill sets that John's crew did. Um, any advice, John, on what a, uh, how, how simple it is to fix this or what the process is for fixing it before we, before we end this video? All right, a lot of it has to do with the fact of how tight the knee wall space is. If you've got a three-foot knee wall, 
um, chances are it's going to be a little bit tight for somebody, you know, normal sized man to get back there and move around. Uh, the tighter it is, the, um, the more difficult it is, which raises the price. Okay. And what you have to do is weigh what the cost is versus the lack of comfort that you have in that particular room and the lack of utility that you have of that room during the middle of the day. Yeah. Um, otherwise it's a pretty easy project to do. It's just a matter of figuring out the knee wall square footage, um, buying enough rigid foam board that comes in four by eight sheets. So you got 32, uh, square feet per sheet and, um, laying it, laying it back there. Um, we used to use uh, button cap nails, uh, like you use for roofing yep. felt. That was the easiest. We had um, button cap nail guns, and it went by pretty quickly. But um, pretty easy job. Just um, if it gets tight back there, you can raise the price a little bit. <laughs> All right. Well, very good. Um, if you have any questions about this, um, especially for John, again, leave us a comment. Uh, head to our website, homeprojects.com. John's email is right there. Uh, if you've got any questions about this or if your contractor has any questions about this, I'd like to ask John a little bit more about this. He'd be ha more than happy to answer it. Uh, and, of course, you know, if, again, if, you've, if you think you've got family or friends who have this issue or if, you've, if you know that um, you know, it's prevalent in your neighborhood, lots of homes with this type of situation, you know, post this video on some of your socials. Let people know what's going on this time of the year this problem is very prevalent you can't you can't outrun it now and again you can't you just simply cannot turn your hvac your air, air conditioning system on um high enough to solve this problem um because you'll freeze out the rest of the house even if your system is capable of getting cold enough to do this you'll freeze out the rest of your house so uh we uh again thank you for watching um hit us up on the socials like subscribe you know the the deal and we'll see you on the next time thank you very much peace